so why is there a difference between the two incidents? Uh, it's because they say and what they write and what the Congress, which is you know at least seventy five percent lawyers, it's how they get around the uh, true. Uh, law of the lawgiver, which is the Lord, and this is man's law and mammon, and he said, take your lumps. It's your problem. All right, well, I'm looking at, me. I'm looking at this, the conscientious objector, right? Right. Who they use as a first example. Yeah. So if he was uh, tried and convicted and he served, say, a year in jail, and then he goes out and he refuses to register again for the draft. They can hit him again. They can hit him again. And they say it's not double jeopardy because it's a different offense. All right, I mean, now we look at the person. it's the same offense. It's just a different time period. That's all that changed. All right, now, all right, so the time period might be critical here because the person who who refuses to identify anybody, right? if she continues, or he, well, in this case, I guess it's a she, but if the individual continues to not want to identify anybody, they're in the court at the same time in the same time right. period. Right. And so that isn't seen as, double, as another offense. Right. So... They can't. They can only charge her for one time. But if, let's say a year later she comes down and does it again. They can try her again. Well, I, I was going to say, yeah, okay. You know, three days pass. They bring her back in and answer the same thing. Uh huh. She's back in the cooker again. Right. The court in Morgan v. Divine, 1915, quoted with approval from Bishop on criminal law. The test is whether if what is set out in a second indictment has been proved under the first, there could have been a conviction. When there could, the second cannot be maintained. Where there could not, it can be. See, it, they, they're all screwed up in their own What's wording. It? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a horrible sentence. Yeah, yeah. It, it is no sentence. Jeez. One of the obvious results in living under our federal form of government is that every person is subject to criminal jurisdiction in two separate governments, the state and the national. It is entirely possible, therefore, for a single act to constitute an offense against the statutes of the United States and at the same time to be punishable under state law. This is true in the case of counterfeiting. The national currency, corrupt practices in the conduct of congressional elections, assaults against federal officers, the larceny of goods moving in interstate commerce, violations of former prohibition amendment. In these cases, it has been long held that a person may be tried and punished in both governments without violating the protection against double jeopardy. That guarantee is violated only by a second trial for the same offense against the same sovereign not by a trial or the same act when it can constitutes a separate and distinct crime against another sovereign. So, in other words, you could do the, the crime in uh, Michigan and Tennessee, and, you know, they can bounce like McVeigh. You know, they wanted to, every state wanted a piece of them. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I mean, do they do that to find out where they can get the best deal? Sure. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> that's something, huh? Well, you know, okay, this is conspiratorial. Well, no, this is not conspiratorial. This is the theoretical. Yeah, yeah. I just find it interesting that the, the state in which he was finally convicted and, and sentenced uh, was by lethal injection. Uh huh. I don't know what Colorado has. I don't know if it's hanging or not. Right. I guess what I'm driving at is, although, you know, I don't know. I just wonder if. Um, he played ball and um, may not be dead, if you know what I'm saying. Right. Uh, is that co is that completely wild uh, to your thinking? No, you know, it's like uh, a lot of lawyers like to shop in, in different southern states for uh, compensation because they can get more compensation in the Alabama and and uh, Mississippi than they can in uh, New York City. But 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 that has to be tied into uh, a criminal being involved in those in, in those different states. Is that correct? Oh yeah, for criminal, yeah. yeah. I mean, you've got to have traffic through all that. Yeah. Right. Hmm. All right. Um, but again, with this with this double jeopardy as it applies to state and federal, though, um, I'm a little confused here because I mean, can, so in other words, if the state can't convict. And it was involved, and it must, I guess it must be involved with interstate commerce, which is federal. Would that right. be right? Yeah. That the feds can jump in and say, okay, the state dropped the ball, we'll, we'll take it and we'll convict? Uh-huh. They, 
can. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Have we seen any... Now, there's one here. It says, um, under the Lanza rule, and the, the, there was a, someone that violated the Volstead Act, the district judge dismissed the indictment on the ground of double jeopardy, and the government appealed. The Lanza rule, though sharply criticized, still stands. A bait versus the United States, 1959, held that a man convicted of a crime in Illinois could later be tried for the same act, dynamiting telephone communications, under federal law, because it would be federal communications. So Illinois could come after him, and so could the United States. Lanza was specifically reaffirmed by a 6-3 to three decision on the same day the court held 5-4 to four that one acquitted in a federal court of robbing a federally insured bank could later be tried and convicted in the same state court for the same robbery, Butkus versus Illinois, 1959. Okay. But wait a minute. Uh, now, the court could be a state court or it could be a federal court. I mean, a bank. I'm sorry. Uh, because uh, even though it's federally insured, the state bank, when we had lost a particular check that was supposed to go to an undertaker uh, for my father, um, the, the undertaker lost the check. And it was a certified check from the bank. Mm -hmm. And I had called up, and I went through all kinds of stuff. And I finally ended up going to the controller uh, of the bank in New York City. And I was told that uh, at first I thought it was federal, and it wasn't. It was state. So, therefore, the state bank, they had nothing to do with it, but yet it was federally insured and everything. And I couldn't get them to issue uh, a, another check to the undertaker that lost it based on the fact that the cash, it was never cashed. And um, then they told me, well, is it a federal or state? Well, because it was uh, a state bank, I'm sorry, it wasn't federal, it was a state bank, I had to go to the controller in New York City, and only after talking to him for about five minutes, uh, this is a six-month deal now, mm -hmm. and then when I finally hit the right person uh, in New York, uh, in five minutes, after explaining everything to him, he issued a check. He, he wrote to the bank. I got a copy of the letter. And he told them in no uncertain terms that they had to issue a check to the uh, undertaker. And uh, they did. Huh. But it took me six months to find who was responsible for, for this fiasco. Huh. And it was the controller of the banks in New York City. What a surprise, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, New York City is like that little thing called London, the city of London, which has nothing to do with England at all. It's all by the crown. It's all owned by the crown. It's like that little piece of Wall Street down there. What about that little piece of Wall Street? Uh, down at 55 Water Street. Mm -hmm. that, that generally run the <laughs> everything that goes on in this country. Usually everything has to go through it. We found some um, interesting stuff similar to what that is in the archives in uh, North Carolina. And when I'm saying archives, I mean the state archives where the the state uh, personnel has the uh, all the records, not a law library or you know, any other kind of county library or anything like that. But uh, <clears throat> there's um, two states and if people don't realize that, there is a, a thing on there on the uh, informer site, it is, um, this is not conjecture, this is not myth, this is not patriot myth. Uh, if they click on that, they'll find out how everything has come circuitous through the crown up to present day and how everything is operating and that we have two different governments. Within the same state, you have two governments and we're dealing in a monarchy. We don't have a democracy. We really have a monarchy. When you say two different governments, uh, to what are you referring? Uh, in the state, if you got um, the de facto is called this state, and everything in the original state is called the state, the and this. And um, we found that there was so many of it that was in there 
that it, the one part, it was in the Halifax Resolves. And I'm going to read you one little part. Okay. And it says, the Halifax Resolves came along in eight, April 12th, 1776, and was done by a select committee after the Fourth Provisional Congress, this is North Carolina, which pulled them in under the Continental Congress, so on and so forth. We said, how do we go forward into a constitutional law and try to find something that will absolutely prove our thesis and our hypothesis that there might be more than one government? Now, I'm reading right off of what Mr. P said. Mm -hmm. So we started reading, and he's talking about me and uh, a fellow called Fraud Buster and another fellow that went actually down into the archives and sat there for three days pulling all this stuff and getting it. What archives is this, in North Carolina? Yeah. Right. Okay. So we started reading, and the first thing we find, by the way, the 